So good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I'm Rika Kierkegaard, Program Specialist with the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this first webinar we're having in a new series of monthly webinars from the Children and AIDS Learning Collaborative that are zooming in on what pediatric HIV programs need to know about COVID-19 and HIV. So while the interaction between COVID-19 and HIV is not yet established, in this webinar, we will try to unpack a little bit what we do know and what we don't know about COVID-19 children and pregnant women and the potential interactions with HIV and implications. We will look at this from a scientific, programmatic and frontliner, uh, frontline provider perspective today through our three different speakers, Dr. Lynn Mofenson, Senior Research Advisor at ECPAF, Laurie Goulet, Regional HIV, HIV Advisor at UNICEF's Regional Office for East and Southern Africa. And then finally, Patrick Oyaro, who is with the Pattern Network and CEO of Health Innovations Kenya. So I'm very pleased to open this webinar with a presentation by Dr. Lynn Mofenson. She is currently working as a Senior Research Advisor at the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. She was at the National Institutes of Health from 1989 until her retirement in 2014, where she was responsible for program planning and the development and scientific direction of research studies and clinical trials in domestic and international pediatric adolescent and maternal HIV infection. These three presentations will take up to one hour, and then we have another around 30 minutes for Q&A and discussions. Um, but before we get started, I'd like just to say a few words about the webinar guidelines. First of all, if you have any trouble hearing or you have other technical issues, um, please send us a message via the chat box and we will try to support as soon as possible. At all times, keep, please keep your mics on mute so we can avoid any background noise. And then please type in any questions you may have at any time using the chat feature. You can also send the questions during the presentations, but we will not be taking them until the Q&A period. During the Q&A period, you can also um, raise your hand to ask a question directly to one of the speakers. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and all materials will be made available online after the webinar on childrenaids.org slash COVID-19 where you will be able to find many more resources from UNICEF and partners and participate in discussions related to COVID-19 and HIV in children and pregnant women. So without further ado, um, Lynn, please, it's your turn. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. What I'm going to do is go over a little bit about the basics of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then briefly talk about effect on mothers and children. So an important note is that please note that the data are limited, they're preliminary, some are of not great quality, and they change almost daily. So let's start with some basic information. So what is a coronavirus? Coronaviruses are single-stranded RNA viruses and they're named because of the spike protein projections on their envelope that, re that resembles a crown. They're classified into four genera based on genomic structure, and they can infect different hosts and have different tissue tropism. And gamma and delta CoV infect birds, fishes, and only a few mammals. The ones of concern to us are the alpha and beta CoVs, which infect only mammals, including human, and have repeatedly crossed species barriers with bats and rodents being the primary sources. There are seven human COVIDs known to date, four of them called, cause mild disease, just colds, and three cause severe disease, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. A little bit on terminology. SARS-CoV-2 means serious acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, and it refers to the virus itself. COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019, is the disease caused by the virus. And this is similar to terminology where we have HIV referring to the virus and AIDS referring to the disease. So how does SARS-CoV-2 cause infection? 
the human receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. And this enzyme is involved in the regulation of blood pressure through catalyzing cleavage of angiotensin 2, a vasoconstrictor, into angiotensin, which is a vasodilator. And this um, is expressed by many cells in the body, as you can see in this figure, with a principal target cell being the lining cells of the lung. And SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 through the spike proteins. And then subsequently, after it comes into the cell, it downregulates ACE2 expression, which could have a negative effect clinically. So this is a very simplified view of the replication cycle from the National Geographic. And you can see that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 and then fuses with the cell membrane and goes into an endosome. And the genetic material of the virus, the RNA, is released. This RNA is translated by host cell ribosomes into polyproteins. And these proteins then undergo cleavage by a viral specific protease. Um, and they form a replicase transcription complex, which enables the viral RNA to replicate using viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. All of these components then ent enter the Golgi apparatus for packaging, and they assemble the viral envelope and the viral RNA binds to one of the proteins, the N protein, to form a ribonucleoprotein complex. And then the mature virion buds out of the Golgi to form an intracellular vesicle. And then finally is carried to the edge of the cell, <coughs> excuse me, and released. So a little bit on epidemiology. A pneumonia of unknown cause was detected in Wuhan in China and first reported to WHO China office on December 31st and was rapidly linked to exposure to the Wuhan seafood wholesale market. This epidemic doubled in size every 7.4 days with transmission among close contacts rapidly becoming evident. So the blue in the graph represents cases linked to the market. The orange in the graph represents cases not linked to the market. And you can see by early January, 94% of the cases were not directly linked to the market. There was then rapid spread outside of Wuhan to the rest of China. You can see five cases December 29th going up to over 51,000 cases, uh, a 10,000 fold increase in less than two months. And then spread outside of China and in the graph when you see is the yellow orange, that's where the cases are outside of China. And by February 25th, cases outside of China exceeded the reports in China. And I have the latest data on the epidemic on the um, right hand side, 2.2 million confirmed cases over 150,000 deaths as of yesterday. So why has there been such rapid global spread? Well, the first is the ease of transmission. It's spread through respiratory droplets and touching contaminated surfaces and then bringing virus that's on that surface to your mucous membrane. And there's a high attack rate because it's infectious before symptoms. Viral shedding appears to start one to three days before symptoms appear. There's prolonged shedding after symptoms, a median duration of 17 days. And th with those with more severe disease and a higher viral load, there's an increased duration of shedding. And reports have shown that transmission can occur from asymptomatic persons. There's a population level lack of immunity. So there's no herd immunity globally. It's a noble, vir noble virus that everyone is potentially susceptible to. And of course, with global tribal, there is the ease of importation of cases. This illustrates the um, COVID-19 disease and both the virus and the host immune response to the virus play a part. Um, the, the percentages here come from the initial report in JAMA on almost 73,000 cases in China. And what you see is stage one or early infection is the time of initial viral replication. There's mild constitutional syndrome, symptoms of low-grade fever, dry cough, headache, diarrhea, 
loss of taste or smell, and some mild changes in laboratory findings. And in 81% of cases, um, the disease stops here and people recover. Stage two is when the host immune response begins to uh, come into effect. They can be shortness of breath, dyspnea, hypoxia. You begin to see abnormal chest X-ray and more severe laboratory findings. And moderate to severe disease occurs in about 14%. And then stage three is the time when the host immune response is really in overdrive, causing a cytokine, uh, cytokine storm, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, cardiac failure, elevated inflammatory markers. And this occurs in about 5%. Um, current estimates for mortality are 1 to 3.8%, with risk factors being older age, male sex, and comorbidity. And in this initial report from China, 1% of people had no symptoms. So SARS-CoV-2 can affect other organs other than the respiratory tract, and I just wanted to bring that to people's attention. There has been uh, described neurologic manifestations, cardiac injury, including two cases of COVID-19-related cardiomyopathy in pregnancy, gastrointestinal symptoms, ocular manifestations, conjunctivitis. We talked about uh, the loss of smell, uh, smell and taste. And increasingly, there's been new reports of uh, acute kidney in injury. So it's a multi-system disease. Risk factors for severe disease and outcomes are shown on this slide. Patient characteristics and then what are the bad viral si vital signs in laboratory. But what I wanted to bring people's attention to was HIV. So as of yesterday, there are only four papers, including eight cases of COVID-19 and HIV in the literature. So really only a minimal amount is known. There were no deaths in these cases, although two were admitted to the ICU. One person had advanced HIV with the CD4 count of 13, and the other had comorbidity. And it's hypothesized that if a patient is on treatment, has a high CD4, COVID-19 disease would not be any different than for those without HIV infection. But COVID-19 disease to date has been in low prevalence countries for HIV, not yet in areas with high HIV prevalence. So we really have too few cases to be able to draw conclusions. And we are now seeing cases in Africa, and it's going to be critical to monitor impact. Uh, this just briefly goes over testing for SARS um, CoV-2, two types of test. One is a direct viral detection test, a real-time nucleic acid amplification test that can be done on a variety of different liquids or, um, or, or tissues, and then an antibody test. Um, the viral detection test tells you about current infection with SARS-CoV-2, and it can inform an individual of their infection status so they can know they're sick and take action to prevent transmission. From the facility point of view, it can inform patient management and actions needed to prevent transmission. And of course, from the public health point of view, inform actions needed to prevent transmission. And as of April 17th, there were 34 commercial diagnostic tests given emergency use authorization by the FDA, including three point of care NAT tests. Um, then there's the SARS-CoV antibody detection tests, viral specific IgG and IgM, which represents past exposure to SARS-CoV-2, and it can detect those who are still susceptible and those who were previously infected and theoretically are immune and can return to work. It can identify individuals that have neutralizing antibody, which may be used in treatment, and facilitate contact tracing and surveillance. There are no proven treatments, but many are under study. And as of the 18th, there were 645 clinical trials. And I just want to briefly go over the um, different places that the treatment strategies are trying to interfere with different steps in the replication strategy. So monoclonal antibodies and neutralizing antibody in convalescent plasma is used to bind to the virus so that it can't bind to ACE2 and prevent entry. Um, Camostat mesylate is a serine protease inhibitor that inhibits trypsin, which is this TMP 
uh, are SS2, which is a different receptor on the cell for a uh, more unusual non-endosomal entry pathway. Um, so this inhibits that so that the, the virus can't enter the cell in that way. Chloroquine and hydrochloroquine decrease the acidity in the endosomes and cell culture studies suggest you need high doses, which could increase toxicity. Lopinavir, ritonavir, and other protease inhibitors inhibit the protease enzyme. Uh, remdesivir and uh, fipivir inhibit the viral RNA polymerase. And then there's a number of different immune response modulators that are being tried to modulate that cytokine storm that we discussed. Um, as I said, there were 645 clinical trials. This shows you where they are. Um, the largest amount are in Europe, followed by the United States and then China. And just to note that these trials generally exclude pregnant and breastfeeding women and children. So I just want to point out that randomized trials are needed to discern efficacy and safety because the scientific data are rapidly changing every day. And what someone says works uh, yesterday may be shown not to work today. And here's a good example. This is a study from March 18th. Everyone was very excited that protease inhibitors were going to be the answer. But this uh, trial showed that lopinavir, ritonavir had no benefit in um, adults hospitalized with severe COVID-19. Everybody's been talking about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. There are at least two studies that show no benefit in patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19 and potentially actually some harmful effects, um, and particularly using higher doses. In contrast, um, remdesivir looks like it may be useful. There is a non-randomized uh, study published in the New England Journal looking at compassionate use, and it looked like uh, clinical improvement was seen in 68% of patients. So we um, await the results of these randomized trials to see if that's really effective. So now to uh, turn to SARS-CoV-2 in children. And this is just a summary. I'm not going to present you all the data. But children appear less likely to be symptomatic than adults, although severe disease can occur. And asymptomatic disease has been reported in 1 to 16% of children. The most common presenting symptoms are cough and fever, but upper respiratory symptoms are also common. And 10% may present just with GI uh, symptoms. Children appear to have less severe disease and less hospitalization. Death can occur, but it is rare and may be more likely in the youngest children. And in the absence of widespread community or serologic testing, it's uncertain what the true proportion of children without symptoms actually is. So this slide shows you the age distribution of COVID-19 in eight large studies from a number of different countries, China, Italy, US, Japan, Korea, Iceland, and Madrid. Um, this shows you the total number of cases. Then you see the number of children and percentage of total cases. And then the remainder show you the proportional age distribution. So out of these studies involving over 250,000 people with COVID-19, children accounted for 1.8% of COVID cases. However, in population-based surveillance and non-symptomatic individuals in Iceland, no infections were detected in 848 children under 10 years who were tested. And of the pediatric cases, 48% were in children 0 to 10 years, with about a third each in those less than 1, 1 to 4, 5 to 9, and 52% were in those 10 to 19 years. Um, this is to demonstrate that the signs of COVID-19 in infancy in particular are very nonspecific. And these are 19 case reports of COVID-19 in infants from around the world. Uh, the, the, the chart shows you country author, age at admission, the initial symptoms, exposure, SARS-CoV testing, and their outcome. And you can see the presentation can be very nonspecific with only URI symptoms, which may or may not have fever, um, may or may not have respiratory symptoms. Two of the 19 cases had no symptoms, 
and one of the 19 cases didn't have any known exposure other than being in an epidemic situation in New York City. All of the children did well, although some required oxygen, some showed uh, signs of liver and cardiac in, uh, uh, injury. So are children less likely to be infected or less likely to be symptomatic? And data from China um, suggest that they're less likely to be symptomatic. And this is a contact tracing study. They identified 391 cases in China and over 1,200 close contacts, followed them for 95 days uh, and looked for the household attack rate, which was 15%. So this graph shows you in purple the attack rate by age, in brown is the proportion of disease that's severe, and in green is the proportion without fever. So children were as likely to be infected as adults up to 50 years, and you can see that in this chart uh, between uh, 5 to 7 percent regardless of age were um, found to be infected. Um, they were somewhat more likely to have no fever in green and also more likely to have non-severe disease in brown. The Iceland data, however, which is population-based screening, suggests that children are less likely to actually be infected. And they conducted targeted testing of symptomatic persons. Um, and then they went ahead and did population-based screening on people without symptoms. So in the targeted screening, 6.7% of children under two um, were positive, that's here in the red box, and male and female were similar. Um, and this compared to 13.7% of those over 10, and in those uh, males were more common than females to be infected. But when they did population-based screening, as I said before, none of the 848 children were positive compared to 0.8%, um, 100 people out of about 12,000 over 10 years. So it's not resolved yet. Are children less susceptible or are they less likely to be symptomatic? This shows you the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 in children. Uh, the different colors show you different symptoms. So fever in blue, cough in orange, shortness of breath in gray were less common in children than adults, and symptoms in general were less common. For example, 93% of adults had at least one of fever, cough, or shortness of breath compared to 73% of children. And, um, 1% of children were reported to be asymptomatic. And these are data from the United States, I forgot to say. This looks at the severity of disease in children. This is the initial large report in pediatrics, over 2,000 cases of children in China. And you can see the majority, 90%, had only mild to moderate disease. A minority, 40%, were um, asymptomatic. Infants under one were at highest risk of having more severe disease. As you can see, 9% of infants under one had severe disease, 2% critical disease compared to the older age groups. These are data from the US. This is looking at hospitalization rate per 100,000 by age. And you can see children under 18 were much less likely to be hospitalized than adults. And this is also data from US looking specifically at children under 18. And the blue shows you the proportion that are hospitalized. And you can see those under age one were most likely to be hospitalized, 62%, compared to 4 to 14% in those that were older. So why might children have milder disease or why might they be less susceptible? So first is that there may be a difference in their immune system compared to adults. Perhaps they're less likely to have a cytokine storm type of response to the virus. Second is the presence of other coronaviruses in the mucosa of the lung and the airway, which could give either cross protection or limit the growth of the virus through direct virus-virus interactions and competition. Coronavirus is the most common cause of the common cold. There might be lower levels of ACE2 receptor in the lung, um, and that would mean that the infection would primarily be in the upper rather than the lower respiratory tract infection. This has been hypothesized in a number of different papers, but I can't find any data that actually addresses this hypothesis. 
And then lastly is that children are less likely to have underlying disease or comorbidity, um, which are associated with a poor prognosis. So moving on to SARS in pregnancy. Again, just a summary of the major data. Clinical manifestations of COVID-19 in pregnant women are similar to non-pregnant individuals, and pregnancy does not appear to increase susceptibility to infection or worsen clinical course, and most infected mothers have mild disease and recover without needing to undergo delivery. However, severe disease necessitating ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and even ECMO can occur. And in the review that was just published in the New England Journal of 118 pregnant women in China, 8% had severe disease, and two thirds of these developed their severe disease postpartum. Um, and there is now at least one death reported, which gives a, a 0.2% mortality rate, which is very consistent with mortality in non-pregnant adults at a similar age group of 20 to 44, where the mortality rate is 0.2%. Although most women present with symptoms while pregnant in a review of 40 papers, including over 500 women, 8% didn't have symptoms until admitted in labor. 2% or after delivery, postpartum, 6%. Additionally, 11% had no symptoms, but were positive on screening for SARS-CoV-2 that were tested either because they were a contact or in New York, they're doing universal screening, which I just want to briefly comment on. So this was reported in the New England Journal, I guess it was earlier this week, last week. Uh, 215 pregnant women who were go undergoing delivery at two hospitals in New York, they're, under, they're doing universal uh, NPPCR testing in labor. Four of the 215 women had symptoms. All of them were positive, 2% uh, rate. 29 of the 210 women without any symptoms who were tested were positive, 14%. And that means that 29 of the 33 women who were tested, 88%, had no symptoms at admission. Um, and fever developed postpartum in the number of these women. So uh, symptoms does not necessarily mean that you're uh, not having symptoms does not necessarily mean you're not infected. Um, looking at pregnancy outcome, infected women, especially those who develop pneumonia, appear to have an increased frequency of preeclampsia, C-section for fetal distress, which is likely more related to severe maternal illness premature rupture of membranes and preterm birth. Whether this is directly due to viral infection or maternal illness is not clear. However, severe neonatal outcomes are rare and most of them are uh, felt to be not associated with maternal COVID-19. Cases of neonatal disease have been reported but appear to be rare and more likely associated with infant exposure to virus postpartum. I'll show you that in a moment. And it's unknown if mother to child transmission can occur. So is there mother-to-child transmission? So let's talk about whether it's feasible and what are the evidence. So if we look at uh, in utero transmission, what are the requirements for something to be transmitted in utero? It requires the pathogen to be able to cross the placenta and to infect the fetus. So there are two questions. Is there a receptor for CARS-CoV-2 in the placenta to enable it to cross the intact placenta? And then the second question, is there a receptor for ACE2 in the fetus, and specifically in the fetal lung, to enable the virus to actually infect the fetus? So the answer to whether ACE2 is found in the placenta is yes. Uh, these are immunohistochemical studies with the brown, meaning that you're seeing ACE2 mRNA, and this looks at the fetal membranes and placenta. And ACE2 was found in the decidua, um, syncytia trophoblast and the villa stroma. And while it was most abundant in the placenta in early gestation, it was also identified at term, no difference between those who went into labor or not labor in the red box here. Again, the decidua and the placenta most common. 
And ACE2 enzyme can apparently been, be found in the fetal lung. These are again him, immunohistochemical localization of ACE with the brown being ACE. And it was found as early as 12 weeks gestation with an age-related increase uh, that peaks in mid-gestation and then appears to remain high throughout gestation and postnatal development. What about intrapartum transmission? So intrapartum transmission requires fetal exposure to infectious virus. So the question is, is SARS-CoV-2 found in vaginal fluids? So there was a study in postmenopausal women with severe COVID-19 where they did vaginal swabs. All samples were negative for the virus and the data to date from pregnant women at delivery, zero of six samples were negative for the virus. However, potential exposure to the virus after birth in the delivery room, which may be contaminated with virus, uh, is possible, but that's really postnatal and not interpartum infection. And what about breast milk? So SARS-CoV-2 PCR has been evaluated in 40 breast milk samples and all have tested negative. And postnatally transmission is more likely through close contact of the infected mother um, with the infant than through breast milk. So this shows you the results of um, SARS-CoV-2 virologic testing. Um, and this is uh, in a review of 40 papers through uh, earlier this week. Um, 36 papers reported on uh, swabs of what they called the newborn. 12 of 337 were positive for a rate of 4%. And then you can see in all of these other samples, amniotic fluid, placenta, cord blood, gastric aspirate, a maternal breast milk vaginal swab, all have been negative, although there's been some uh, virus detected in infant stool. I want to just briefly go over proposed definitions for mother to child transmission that were in uh, this nice article in Acta Obstetric Germ uh, Gynecology. It accounts for both maternal testing, symptoms of the, in the infant, um, more stringent definition if there are no symptoms, detection of the virus, including what type of sample with blood and amniotic fluid being more important than placenta, which is more important than NP swab, and then finally the presence of IgM antibody. So for in utero transmission, it requires that a test is actually done at birth and confirmed or probable infection requires detection of the virus in cord or neonatal blood, amniotic fluid, or the placenta. And if you find the virus in an NP swab, it also must be in the placenta to be viewed as confirmed in utero. And possible infection is IgM antibodies, even if the NP swab is negative. Intrapartum infection confirmed requires NP swab positive at birth and 24 to 48 hours. Possible is NP swab positive at birth and no test at 24 to 48 hours. And finally, postpartum requires detection in NP or anal, anal swab uh, greater than 48 hours and preferably negative at birth. So here are the cases uh, that are virologically positive. We have 11 cases with viral uh, uh, RNA detected. And then we've got seven cases with uh, IgM. And this looks at, was the mother positive? Yes. Did the infant have symptoms? It was very unclear in some of these papers. Whether there was a birth sample, and you can notice most of these are not birth samples. The type of sample, none of them were included placenta. The timing of the sample, and then what happened with later tests. So if we look at this, we can see that none of the infants that had a positive NP swab meet the definition of confirmed or probable in utero transmission because there was no birth, blood or placental sample or an antibody test. Two of these, the ones that were done within 24 hours, meet the definition of possible intrapartum transmission. They had a positive test at less than 24 hours with no second test. And then nine meet the definition of probable postnatal if we, if we view the 30, 30 to 36 hours as equal to 48 hours. Um, the IgM tests do meet the definition of possible in utero infection because they had positive IgM in cord blood, although negative detection of the virus in blood. 
So what can we draw in terms of conclusions? Well, the serologic data are not definitive, but suggestive. The finding of ACE2 receptors in the placenta and fetal lung suggest it is feasible, it's possible to be transmitted in utero. But the virologic data in IgM serology are suggestive, suggestive, but no birth testing. And the rapid conversion from PCR positive to PCR negative, and the rapid decrease in IgM from very high to uh, near negative within a few days is concerning regarding the potential for positive, false positive tests. So thus, is it positive? Is it possible that there's in utero transmission? Yes, do we have definitive proof? Not at this time, and we need better studies to define it. So in summary, children appear to have mild and less severe disease than adults, may have asymptomatic carriage. Severe disease can rarely occur and appears more frequently in infants. The exact burden of SARS-CoV in children in the overall population remains to be defined. Pregnant women don't appear to have an increased risk of infection or severity of disease, but severe disease and even death can rarely occur. Adverse pregnancy outcome may be increased, but it may be more due to systemic disease in the mother than direct effect of the virus. And evidence to date for SARS-CoV-2 mother-to-child transmission is um, limited. And thank you for your attention, and I will stop sharing so that you can move. There we go. Thank you so much, Lynn. This was an excellent presentation and I think really set the stage uh, for our coming presentations and for our discussion. And um, I see there's a very large number of questions already. And because we're more than 400 people on this webinar so far, uh, we'll be taking all of the questions from the chat box just so it's more easy to manage. But please uh, keep them coming and we'll answer them after the last presentation. Um, there's also quite a few people that have asked for the slides. Both the slides and the recording will be avail uh, made available online on childrenaids.org slash COVID-19 within a day or two. So I would like to introduce our next speaker. Ms. Laurie Goulet has been UNICEF's regional HIV AIDS advisor for Eastern and Southern Africa since June 2019. Prior to this, she was a senior regional HIV specialist on PMTCT and pediatric HIV. And she has more than 30 years of experience in public health focused on HIV, TB, and maternal and child health programming. And she has worked over 15 years as an independent consultant for UN agencies, US government, and international NGOs in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the US. So it's my pleasure to hand the mic over to you, Laurie. Thanks very much, Rike. Is the slide showing? The slide is showing, uh, but please speak up. Your voice is still a little bit distant. Ah, okay. Let me try. Great. It's it's good now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying thanks to everybody for being here at this webinar, and even more importantly, thank you for the continued and dedicated work under what are now both very difficult personal and professional circumstances. I'm really grateful to be part of this this webinar. So let me jump in. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the impact of the disease in East and Southern Africa, where we're at, as well as some very early discussions around programming. So I'll start with the context, move to what we are seeing as programming priorities and early implementation, and then just one slide on emerging needs and asks. In terms of the programming, I'm not limiting to UNICEF, of course, trying to speak broadly, but the situation is changing very quickly. There's a lot going on, so forgive oversights, please. So, um, Laurie, sorry to, to interrupt, but there are a couple of people that are asking if you can move closer to the mic. If is, that, possible. is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the slide is showing nicely. Yes. Great. Okay. So um, I wanted to start on this slide, which shows you the number of cases across 18 countries in East and Southern Africa. Um, obviously, the largest epidemic is in South Africa. The next highest is Kenya, which is tenfold, more than tenfold less. So the numbers of cases, the numbers of deaths, and the numbers of recoveries are still looking very 
low. And there, there's some variation in the recoveries in part because countries are using slightly different definitions and requirements for recovery. But the main, main point I wanna make here is that testing in this region is still extremely low. So for example, in one country as of last week, there were only 24 tests taken and another just under 300. So it's very hard to know exactly what the picture is in terms of the spread of the disease right now. This is a great table from the Africa CDC. Again, I've taken out 18 countries from East and Southern Africa, and it shows the very bold and early uh, control measures that are being taken across countries. All 18 have closed schools. All 18 have banned mass gatherings and closed public spaces. Most have, are in full lockdown. Some like here in Kenya are in partial lockdown. And you, 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 you compare this to the number of cases and it's a very different situation than we're seeing in other parts of the world. So what else can we say about the implementation context here? And I think you're all very familiar with the fact that this region is the epicenter of the global HIV epidemic. We have widespread poverty, very young population pyramids, high population density in parts of the countries. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic comes on top of ongoing emergencies, including drought, conflict, uh, the locusts, political rest, and economic distress. We also generally have weak health infrastructure and limited health workforce. Finally, while the, I'm sorry, finally, while the early and strong response measures being taken by governments may well be controlling COVID-19, they are also affecting movement, prices, income, food security, and availability and access to social services. So the point here being that it really is a multi-sectoral response that will be required now and over time. I'm going to focus on the programming specifically on HIV here, however. Um, so what are some of the considerations countries are looking at as they decide how to um, tailor their HIV programs? One is who and where are the most vulnerable populations and how can they be prioritized? Um, what are the COVID response measures that are in place and how do they affect both service delivery and vulnerability? And what are the short, medium, and long-term needs? In some ways, we're in a preparation stage now, but there will be a peak and then there will be a recovery. So one needs to think across that timeline. So a little bit about what, what's evolving as the priorities and early implementation. And let's start with the populations. Uh, uh, following Lynn's um, presentation, her the point she made that data are limited, preliminary, et cetera, also affects programming because in some ways we're programming in an evidence vacuum around how this disease will play out in the region and particularly among people living with HIV. I'm not gonna repeat what she has already said, but we can infer that people living with HIV who are immunosuppressed may be more at risk of complex and severe forms of COVID-19 and mortality. And this could include children, adolescents, and pregnant and breastfeeding women living with HIV who are not on treatment, who are not diagnosed, who are unstable on treatment, who are experiencing treatment failure, or possibly children who have been HIV exposed but remain uninfected. So just a little more on these populations in East and Southern Africa. According to UNAID's most recent spectrum estimates, we have 425,000 children in the region living with HIV who are not on treatment. Three quarters of these are in seven countries. We don't know the number of adolescents who are not on treatment, um, but we do know that there are issues and challenges with adherence and retention in this age group, and that viral load suppression rates tend to be lower. The th there are also three countries that have the highest AIDS-related adolescent deaths in this region. Um, we have done really well in maternal ARV coverage during pregnancy in this region. However, there are challenges in retaining mother-infant pairs through breastfeeding, and there's a significant amount of seroconversion during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So these women could potentially be at more risk. And that I always put in a plug for that wonderful PMTCT stack bar analysis, which can help us locate and quantify these women at national and subnational level. Finally, as I say, there are unknown considerations about the 10.6 million children 
who, who are in this region that have been exposed to HIV or ARVs but are uninfected. Some of the early research among these children showed a higher vulnerability to severe infection, especially under two years of age. So this could be certainly an area of concern. I, I can say that we don't know a lot about other variables such as nutritional uh, status and other um, infections. So we've kind of coined CPR for our programming priorities. We're not in resuscitation mode yet, but the acronym works. Um, C is for continuity of HIV services and supplies. And I just want to emphasize that this is not just about treatment, but also testing and prevention. Um, the P is for prevention and protection for people living with HIV and health workers from COVID-19. And finally, as Lynn emphasized, there's a great need for research and documentation on the interaction between HIV and COVID-19. So to dig into these a little bit deeper, what are we seeing and, and what are people doing around the region? Um, there are reports of declines in clinic attendance. That's not just HIV, that's across the services from several countries. And medical services are most often exempt from lockdown. So this is credited to widespread fear, limited and expensive transport and other factors. We've also heard a lot about redeployment of health workers to the COVID-19 response, which seems a bit early given the number of cases, but it is indeed happening. We've also heard about looming ARV shortages and possibly test kits too. And then certainly community-based services and outreach have been curtailed in some countries. So what's being done? Governments are rapidly introducing modified and interim guidance around COVID-19 and HIV. Um, they are also ramping up multi-month refills and expanding eligibility criteria, often though children, adolescents, and pregnant women are still excluded from these, um, this guidance. Uh, trying to align multi-month refills with the supply of ARVs, for example, I think Eswatini and Zambia have gone for three to four months rather than six-month refills in respect of the supply they have on hand and when anticipated uh, additional supply will come. Different models of community, community delivery are being tried depending on movement restrictions, et cetera. Some clinics are modifying flow for physical distancing or separate areas altogether. This can lead to higher waiting time, so may also be contributing to the declines in attendance. We have, uh, we personally have less information on testing right now, but we know that some countries such as Eswatini are promoting more self-testing during this time. Finally, remote and virtual platforms are being expanded for appointment tracking and adherence support. This is just to show you some of the guidance that's coming out very quickly. Uganda, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Ethiopia, the provinces in South Africa are all putting guidance about managing HIV in the context of COVID or managing COVID with, with HIV considerations. I just want to acknowledge that the Q&A that came out from World Health Organization very quickly on COVID, HIV, and antiretrovirals has really been used to inform this guidance um, and, and very helpful. In terms of prevention and protection, the context is that there is a limited supply of PPE and limited physical space for infection prevention and control at facilities. Um, in many countries, community-based peer support, teen clubs, other face-to-face -face activities have been halted. And the myths and, and misconceptions around COVID-19 are highly prevalent and creating a great deal of fear. Um, in terms of what's going on, procurement is underway uh, for health workers and, and, and more discussions around for community countries as well. There are a lot of facts and information materials and resources coming out on COVID-19, including specifically for people living with HIV. These are being adapted to the local context and the audience. Um, lots of rapid messaging and information for radio, social media, phone-based and digital information, including specifically tailored for adolescents. Largely, this messaging is around reinforcing prevention measures, reducing misconceptions and myths, and providing mental health and psychosocial support, which, of course, the lockdowns and other things are are contributing to issues there. And finally, emerging is some real meaningful engagement of people living with HIV and adolescents living 
with HIV in the COVID-19 response because indeed we do have a lot to share. Um, here's just some lovely pictures of some of the resources that are out there. Many of them look, may look very um, familiar to you. We are delighted as UNICEF to have contributed to some of these as well. Finally, our research and documentation on HIV and, and, and COVID. Um, and, and then this is the area where we probably know the least about, so welcome inputs um, from the participants as well. As far as we know, there's no standard reporting form or template as yet in the region for COVID-19 and HIV co-infection. Um, also, the limited testing and the difficulty in identifying asymptomatic and mild cases will really challenge um, the kind of controlled research that needs to be done, um, especially in terms of a statistical analysis. Um, in terms of implementation, countries are selecting and monitoring indicators to quickly detect and respond to changes in service delivery. For example, this could be monitoring the number of visits, etc. Some countries are considering or already undertaking very rapid assessments of, among PLHIV to see the issues and inform the response. Um, there is some planning underway for research of COVID and HIV in the region. We've heard about a bit from South Africa and a couple of INGOs, um, not yet finalized protocols of the ones we've heard. But as I say, we have not explored this systematically and would really welcome additional information on efforts that are getting underway or already underway. Finally, one slide on emerging, emerging asks and needs. Try to organize these into four areas. In terms of coordination, um, I would say these are more targeted at regional and global level. Um, how can the rapidly emerging information, resources, webinars, guidance, and support be brought together to more coherently uh, leverage greater impact and results. We've heard a lot from countries about government leading and existing TWGs and committees being organized so that guidance is developed with stakeholder input, et cetera. So that's very, very encouraging. In terms of supply with the expansion of multi-month refills and travel movement restrictions, including cargo airlines, et cetera, what can be done to prevent stockouts of ARBs and other supplies, including broader SRH supplies. Um, what new ways can be found to provide services and support across the HIV continuum while, while physically distancing? And how can we rapidly evaluate these new approaches? And finally, in terms of information, what indicators should be tracked on service continuity to rapidly detect declines? Can we standardize this? And um, how can monitoring research be promoted and um, may be consolidated on a platform and, and, and better standardized because we really do need to generate this learning um, with some urgency. So I just wanna acknowledge uh, our wonderful team in ISARO, the 15 country offices that contributed along with their governments and implementing partners, and of course the HQ team. But I really wanna end with this slide and this lovely quote from the leaders of ICAP and a few pictures to just share some of the creative and novel interesting ways that people are working on COVID prevention and COVID response. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Laurie. I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty of more creative solutions coming out from, from the region. And thank you for providing us these um, programmatic insights. I'm sure there will really be a lot of learnings coming out moving forward. Um, I would like to introduce now our third and final speaker, Patrick. Um, and let me just upload his slides. Um, okay. Dr. Patrick Oyaro is a medical doctor and epidemiologist with 16 years of experience in managing HIV care and treatment programs in Kenya. He currently serves as the CEO of Health Innovations Kenya, which supports the HIV services of a USAID funded Orphans Vulnerable Children's Project. He is also a site principal investigator of two studies on optimization of viral load testing among children 
pregnant and postpartum women, and he is a board member of the Pediatric Adolescent Treatment African Network. So over to you, Patrick. All right, thank you. Um, just to confirm, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Right, so PATA has uh, distributed a survey across its network, and uh, I will be representing PATA and speak uh, to some initial inputs from PATA frontline health providers and technical assistants and some initial trends from the health provider survey. Um, the survey is still open and uh, the details will be shared in a mail following this webinar by UNICEF for health providers who would still like to participate. But I will give some uh, broad strokes from the 124 plus surveys already received. Um, just a little about Kenya, um, that Kenya, as ha has been shared earlier, has 270 cases and we've reported uh, 14 deaths. Nine out of all the cases are children below 15 years, uh, which uh, is about 3%. And uh, uh, we, the report shows that 45% are, are local transmissions. And uh, so I will just next slide. Yeah, so um, we have some level of preparedness, though not adequate, as uh, health workers still a uh, way to get uh, PPE and test kits. Uh, the government is doing its best uh, to, to conduct tests, and we're seeing the possibility uh, of uh, use of gene expert machines uh, to ensure that we're able to test more than uh, we have tested so far. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is a quote from one of our technical advisors uh, who says that the importance of frontline health providers, both in, both in the community and the health facility is greater now than ever. That health providers need to be equipped with information, resources, and protection. Because these are the people who are attending to uh, our patients, whether they're people living with HIV or general patients who come to the health facility. And we have to make sure that they're adequately prepared to be able to uh, offer the services uh, as required. I mean, on the ground, uh, we have health workers showing fear on how to keep uh, safe by themselves, observing social distancing uh, while still providing services that are necessary uh, to the patients that we serve. Uh, next. Yeah, so from the uh, 124 respondents across 13 countries, uh, mostly from um, East and Southern Africa, uh, I, I can talk about Zimbabwe having uh, most, most of the respondents are from Zimbabwe. Then we have Zambia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Uh, but you're hopeful that uh, uh, other countries will soon join in to give us uh, the views and concerns concerning COVID-19. Uh, and 19. We hope that by the survey closing date, we should be able to double our response rate so, uh, so that we can uh, get more facilities participate. From what we have collected, we see that most of the facilities are secondary level and peri-urban, lo located with a, a reasonable representation across all the levels of, of healthcare. We have a few urban and uh, rural facilities. Next. Yeah, so um, just a few uh, summaries that we've been able to pick from uh, the 124 uh, uh, respondents is that 27% report to have three plus month ARV supply and uh, can provide multi month uh, drug refills. Then you have 13% of the respondents say to have uh, a triage system in place. 27% have hand wash stations and, or, or sanitizers in the health facility. We have 64% who report to have no COVID-19 tests or screening ability. Uh, again, it depends on what uh, the countries have decided to adopt because there are possibilities that only a few health facilities in the country have been selected to be either uh, 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 isolation centers or probably quarantine centers. So uh, 
availability of test kits will depend on what the country has decided to put in place. Uh, less than 4%, and that's very important for us to take note of, less than 4% have sufficient PPE, masks, gowns, and gloves. And if we are to move forward, then as I indicated earlier, that we need to protect our frontline health workers to be able to provide services without being scared. 71% uh, of the clinics have no respirator support equipment. Again, uh, that can be argued out that um, which health facilities currently would need respirators. But again, as probably countries are looking at the, the modeling, if the numbers increase, then it means more health facilities will likely become isolation centers and you may need uh, respirators. Next slide. 23% uh, do not have an SOP on COVID-19 screening management in place, and 60% of those report that they need more SOPs. So this is very important. And I, I feel that SOP is not a, a very complicated thing that, uh, uh, and, and I believe that that is something that we can borrow and, and be able to, to put in place. 20% do not have an SOP on infection control personal safety protocols and use of PPE, and 62% uh, report they need more. Again, uh, that's, that's a low number. 68% um, report their clinic is unprepared. And again, we need to look into this critically. If the clinics are not prepared, what are we going to do about that? 95% uh, uh, of plus respondents report feeling stressed about COVID-19. Again, um, let's talk about uh, mental health. We are in a situation where the, the, the participants, the patients that we serve, we need to address the mental health aspects. What about the health workers? If you have a, a health worker who is worried about or stressed about his health in the first place, then there are chances that the services are not going to be offered well. So that's something that we, we need, really need to look into. And then 50% indicate that the community needs sensitization and more information about COVID-19. Next slide. So in, in summary, uh, the key themes that have come out so far uh, 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 from the 124 uh, respondents is that we have fear of the unknown, anxiety. Uh, when people look at the news in Europe, or in US, and uh, they look at the health systems that uh, we have currently, yeah, the health systems that we have currently, what's going to happen next? Suppose that the numbers hit high, yeah, are we going to manage? So there is a lot of fear, there's anxiety amongst uh, uh, the health workers, and that is something we need to look into. Uh, what about the, guide, the guidance? I've talked about SOPs. And uh, uh, when we look at social media, we get a lot of uh, forwards, we get a lot of information. Of course, governments have given out guidelines. The question is, how do these guidelines trickle down to that service provider in the lowest possible health facility? We need to have uh, these guidance put somewhere in a language that they can understand and implement, uh, uh, imp implement well. Same information, overlooked or, or overlooked or overloaded. Again, we have official information that is coming out. And then we have a lot of additional information that is coming out. Some are fake news. We have myths and misconceptions. So we have to look for the best way to be able to filter and be able to guide our health workers that this is the right information that you need to follow. The other information that is being shared is, is not correct. This will help us to be able to uh, manage COVID-19 well. Safety and uh, lack of PPE. I think this is a big issue that governments need to, 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 to take up. Um, I can talk, for example, Kenya, this cabinet secretary talked about companies local companies being uh, empowered to be able to uh, manufacture uh, PPE so that we're able to try and meet the demands. And it's, it's not just for the health worker. There are situations where uh, patients or participants are expected to, for example, 
don a mask before they enter the health facility. So if a patient doesn't have a mask, what happens? Uh, it means that the, the patient will likely probably remain at the gate and the health workers have to design creative ways of, of still packing medication for them and taking to them at the gate. How do they reach the health facility? How do the patients reach the health facility? That is a concern that we have to look into. Managing HIV services. Is there a possibility that a lot of resources have been moved away from HIV services and everyone is concentrating on COVID-19? And the fear is when we come back, are we going to start dealing with children who are failing treatment? Are we going to come back and start dealing with a uh, lack of uh, uh, adequate drugs, like uh, insufficient drug stocks. Uh, so we have to be very careful that we don't lose the gains that we have made. If we are already recording, uh, uh, reducing uh, trends of mother to child transmission, for example, when we come back, are we worried that we're going to have uh, uh, increased cases? That's something that has to be, to be looked into. Then we have mental health, as I've indicated, we, mental health issues need to be addressed both for uh, the patients that we serve and the health workers. And lastly, um, uh, multiple, multiple vulnerabilities. We have other issues, food insecurity, joblessness, increasing levels of domestic violence, children out of school. Not everyone is safe at home. How do we deal with these relational pandemics of poverty and violence. So we have a lot of things that we need to uh, address so that we can uh, uh, succeed uh, uh, in our various uh, countries. So uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, I just as I'd indicated that uh, the survey is on for uh, one more week. And uh, if we have additional information, we can uh, advise that we fill in the survey so that we can get more information. Probably uh, additional themes will come up so that we can come up with interventions to be able to address these things uh, in time. Yeah, thank you. So I appreciate all uh, the survey respondents and the frontline health providers and peer supporters, UNICEF, uh, Health Innovations Kenya and the PATA team for uh, putting out this survey so that we can get this information. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rika. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was really interesting. And as you mentioned, we will be sending out um, a recording of this webinar where everyone can also find the slides available online as well as links um, to this survey in different languages. So we are now moving on to the Q&A and open discussion. We have just around 20 minutes um, and it will be moderated by my colleague Shafiq Isaji, who is our senior advisor for HIV and AIDS at UNICEF headquarters in New York. You can write your question in the chat box as mentioned. Um, and we will be taking a few of the questions that appeared in the beginning from Lynn's presentation onwards, and then we'll move on to new questions. So Shafiq, over to you. Thank you very much, Enrique. And uh, thank you all colleagues for joining. Um, I, I might say this is the largest uh, group of folks we've ever had on uh, one of our webinars. So more than 400, uh, and 10 participants at one stage, and that's fantastic. And it just shows really how important this issue is across the board uh, for our communities. Um, and um, we had people from all over the world, uh, uh, certainly all over the African continent, but also Morocco, India, um, uh, many colleagues from UNICEF in different settings. Uh, and it's wonderful to see such engagement um, dozens of questions coming in, so I'm going to attempt to summarize some of them. Um, and we'll start with some of the questions for Lynn. Uh, Lynn, the JAMA report showed 1% of cases as being uh, asymptomatic. That was from the China experience. Uh, do we have any more recent updates on that? Um, and then uh, Patricia asked, 
whether uh, all pregnant women uh, should be tested as part of their protocol for being admitted? Is that something that you would suggest? Uh, and are you aware of whether children with asthma that may be well controlled are more at risk of uh, COVID disease? Uh, and then a third question, and, I, and I'll stop after this. Third <laughs> yeah, one, I you're promise, not going to Lynn. remember them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop after the third one. Marjorie from Mothers to Mothers asked a couple of questions. Um, uh, uh, do we have any evidence of uh, changes in vaccination um, uh, or other uh, uh, changes in primary health care behaviors as a result of, of COVID? And is there any evidence that vaccination for influenza and other vaccines may show any protective benefit against COVID. So let's start with, with that batch of questions and then uh, we have more. Okay, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So um, the first question was about the percent that's asymptomatic. Yeah. And um, so that, that China report, the initial China report of 72,000 cases were relying really on people who came in with symptoms. And it looks like um, as increasing reports come along that there is a higher percentage of asymptomatic um, people than originally thought. But I haven't seen anything that's been definitive. For kids, I've seen anywhere from 1% to 16%. And then, of course, we have the New York City data, which suggests it's much higher than that. Um, the question about screening in pregnancy. So I, I really can't um, you know, express an opinion other than that apparently in New York, um, where they definitely had, you know, they were the epicenter in the US, um, their screening identified a large number of women who were asymptomatic when they came in at labor, but a number of them became symptomatic postpartum. Um, so that data suggests that in that kind of setting where you have such diffuse community spread that that might be not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't want to come out with a recommendation myself at this point. The question about asthma is interesting. And um, uh, I was reading something yesterday which noted that the proportion of people with comorbidity of asthma that have um, severe COVID-19 is actually less than people expect for whatever reason. So I would say that someone who has well-controlled asthma does not appear to be at great risk, uh, greater risk of having severe disease um, based on very limited data. And, and again, I would say what I had my first slide, the data change every day. Um, the data are, you know, coming out too quickly to be able to absorb well. Um, lots of papers in journals that are not necessarily very well peer reviewed. So that's why I think things change every day. So uh, um, the issue about um, immunization uh, protecting, so no, uh, influenza is completely different than uh, coronavirus. So influenza vaccine will not protect. Um, and then I think the final question was, is COVID resulting in people avoiding primary health care? And I don't think there's been a whole lot of study, but I did see one particular paper in AIDS behavior that was reporting that people may become afraid to go um, for routine care because they're worried about getting COVID. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's not affecting some people. Then thank you very much um, for those great responses. I'm going to switch to Laurie. There were also a number of questions that uh, were asked uh, that were addressed specifically to Laurie. Priscilla was asking about cases in kids uh, among the African cases. Is CDC Africa capturing pediatric data? We did hear from Patrick about the 3% of cases that were among kids in the Kenya cohort. And then another Priscilla, Priscilla Mulenga, noted that uh, Zambia is providing six monthly prescriptions. So that's just a, a comment rather than, than a question. Um, and then Tomomi wanted to know about guidance on the 
continuity of uh, services for RMNCH, HIV and nutrition, are there plans on developing that for the Asara region? And I presume that that's a question specifically about UNICEF's response uh, around developing that guidance. So over to you, Laurie, with those three questions. Um, thanks so much, Shafiq. I have tried to answer some of them in the chat yes, box, so um, people can look there as well. Um, Priscilla, great question about the disaggregated data. Um, there has been a little bit available, but the truth is it's not, it's not coming out yet. And even South Africa's probably produced the most, but then there's the, the value is missing for so many of the cases that it's hard to make any generalizations. But it certainly looks like, uh, you know, a much smaller percentage in children as, as we see in other settings. But, but the data is not is not robust enough to make strong statements. Um, for the other Priscilla, <laughs> uh, thanks for the clarification. Just like for Lynn, the programming information is changing really rapidly. And we had heard this week um, that some countries had switched from six months to three, four months to preserve stock. So thanks for the correction, appreciate it. In terms of integrated guidance, um, some of the guidance at country level is integrated and, and looks more cross-sectorally. Other governments have chosen to just develop quick addendums or interim measures that they know that will be updated frequently. At UNICEF, in terms of continuity of essential services, we, we do in fact put out integrated um, guidance and this also is is evolving and updated quite regularly. And we are just now finalizing an even broader sort of cross-sectoral approach to the guidance around COVID-19. Over. Great, thank you very much. And just a quick note, if you're responding to questions through the chat box, please remember to um, send your messages to all panelists and all attendees. If you respond back to just panelists, I think it's just the people who are the presenters and the moderators who are seeing those comments. So please send on to, uh, to everybody. Thank you very much. So a couple more questions for you, Lynn. Um, uh, uh, Michael asks whether the presence of ACE2 receptors in the heart, the kidney and the gut may explain the multi-system nature of the disease. Uh, and William Ringera wonders whether you came across anything related to ACE inhibitor therapy in that context. Um, and then a question from Francesca on how the virus is getting into the placenta in the first place. And is there a virenic phase during the course of infection? So Lynn, those three questions for you, please. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I agree that I believe that the fact that ACE receptors are broadly found in many tissues will mean that the virus can infect many different tissues. So um, I, absolutely, I think the fact that ACE receptors are found in all of these tissues, the heart, you know, the, the GI tract, et cetera, um, are one of the reasons for seeing multi-system disease. The other reason would be the cytokine storm type of picture. But, um, but I do think that there's organ, other organ-specific infection that's occurring. The ACE inhibitor question is very interesting. So I'm not an adult doctor, but my understanding is the way that the um, angiotensin inhibitors work is by blocking the, um, the, the angiotensin II vasoconstrictor peptide to the cell, as opposed to blocking the ACE2 enzyme, which is on the cell that, um, that, that enzymatically makes angiotensin II go to angiotensin, which is a vasodilator. So um, it, it, a, the ACE inhibitors would not directly affect the ACE2 receptors. However, the ACE inhibitors also happen to increase ACE2. Um, uh, and so there's, there's, there's two modes of debate. One is that if they increase ACE2, could that mean disease is worse because there's more viral receptors? Or 
is ACE2 protective, and because the virus causes ACE2 to decrease, that the, um, that the inhibitors make it increase, so that's something good. Um, in any case, what's currently recommended is that people stay on their current hypertensive uh, uh, medication and not change based on this. There is one clinical trial that is looking at um, LOSAR, L O S A R T A N. Losartan, Losartan, yes. Thank you. That that <laughs> they're looking at that for treatment. Yes. So there there are some people looking at that. And then the last question was how to get to the placenta. So yes, they're actually they haven't really described a viremic phase very well, but there is clearly a viremic phase because you're you're getting infection potentially of multiple organs, right? So you know, you inhale the virus, it multiplies in the lung. Why would it cause problems in the heart, et cetera, if you didn't have some viremic phase? And the virus can be found in the blood um, rarely, but most people aren't looking in the blood, they're looking in the nose. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, can I trouble you with a couple more questions? There was a whole bunch of questions about vulnerability risk and age. Um, Mohammed noted that men seem to be at high risk of severe disease and also higher mortality. If you could comment on that. Um, Tomi and uh, Marjorie from Mothers to Mothers and also Priscilla asked about malnourished and stunted children um, and whether they might be at higher risk of infection or whether paradoxically they might actually be at lower risk because they also have a degree of malfunctioning immune systems. And if the immune system seems important in uh, contributing to the pathogenesis, you know, how do, you, how do, we, how do we put that together uh, in terms of, of potentially predicting what might happen to children that are malnourished? Um, and then Jeff asked a related question about the elderly. Why is it that they seem to get sicker when they most likely have relatively poorer and lower immunity in general uh, as age progresses? Why are we seeing apparently more disease if, uh, if the potential for cytokine storm and, and that immune response might be diminished in older patients? So let's, let's stop with those questions. Lynn, over to you. Yeah, I'm having um, my my computer. Lynn, I think we've lost you. If you're if you're still listening to us. Oh. Ah, there you are. You're back. Okay, so um, this is very strange. So I could only hear part of the questions. Yeah. Um, I heard something about malnutrition, et cetera. Yes, and Mal malnutrition and stunting. Uh, yeah. Do you anticipate more risk or more uh, more risk of more susceptibility to infection and or more severe disease? Um, there was a question about men and why men seem to do worse, uh, and a general question mm -hmm. about immunity and the elderly. We have the popular belief that people who are older have waning immunity, poorer immune responses. And Hi, yet, can you hear me, Shafiq? I'm... Yes, we can hear you, Lynn. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, I think we don't have any data to be able to say anything about malnutrition and stunting yet. Um, there's, there's nothing in the papers that have been published on pediatrics that have really talked about that. Um, most of the papers don't really talk about comorbidities very much in, in children. So I think, you know, we, we it, I don't know. Um, the question about men, there, there's um, some interesting suggestion that there are more ACE2 uh, um, enzymes on the cells in men, that maybe that's one of the reasons. And um, with the elderly, it may be, um, you know, that, that they already have compromised lung systems, organ systems, and, and hence um, that they're more fragile when they get infection um, as opposed to the cytokine storm. But all of those questions need research to answer, and um, it, it just doesn't. 
Okay, we, we lost you at the end, Lynn, but I think you were done with your responses. So let me switch quickly to Patrick. Um, Patrick, Lucy asked about the respondents of the study, of the, of the survey. Were they talking about their country or their own facility? Uh, and based on what we know from people at the front line, what is driving the, the stress that um, people are describing? Is it fear? Uh, is it that they may be or are already getting too busy, although the case rates to date in Sub-Saharan Africa would suggest that probably facilities are not yet overwhelmed with cases of COVID. What is that, what is that, uh, that stressor? And then Elizabeth wanted to know whether, um, to, your, to, your, to your knowledge, whether there's any uh, availability of um, COVID uh, uh, information in local languages, um, local Sub-Saharan African languages is mostly restricted to English. Over to you, Patrick. Um, yeah, um, thank you for, uh, for those questions. So the respondents were mainly uh, talking about their respective clinics, but again, uh, partner networks uh, are across several countries. And in each country, there are several clinics that have, uh, have, have known about PATA and probably uh, got the survey. So in our analysis, we can also look at the number of health facilities that have, have, have responded uh, in one country. And we, some of the, uh, are the, the, some of the, the, hello, can you get me? Yes, yes, sorry, we can lost you, you for a moment, Patrick, but you're back. Oh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> so some, some of the, the issues, the questions, for example, availability of PPE, most of the time, most likely that can be generalized unless um, governments decide to probably just provide PPE to, to selected health facilities and leave some health facilities. So depending on the questions that they're responding to, we are able to say that this is just limited to this health facility, but some of these responses can probably be generalized. Um, as far as stress is concerned, my hypothesis is that the, the health workers probably have the fear that they, they can contract uh, uh, COVID. And this is in relation to availability of protection, availability of PPE for them to be able to take care of themselves. Um, it, it may not just be from maybe patients who come to the health facility, but I was there was a case, I think it's in the US, where there was transmission from health workers to fellow health workers as they're waiting to attend to patients. So it's something of concern. Uh, we can delve into these uh, further to find out what is really causing the stress. What are, what are they really stressed about? But I believe that it's because of fear of, of getting infected. Because as Shafika said, uh, right now, the health facilities, some of the health facilities are not really overwhelmed because patients have been given drugs for three months. And, and uh, so the numbers, there's decongestion of the clinic. So the work in the uh, 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 clinics that are serving people living with HIV uh, is not uh, much. Um, as far as IEC materials are concerned, I may not be able to talk about uh, uh, most of the countries, but that is something that we can uh, find out more uh, about. But in Kenya, for example, I, I know that the local radio stations uh, have been able to host people who can talk about COVID. And uh, depending on the listenership, I believe that this re reach a, a lot of people. Uh, the other thing is that I've seen posters and flyers that have been translated into local languages. So this uh, may be country dependent. Uh, it's something that probably if we get to hear from other countries, uh, they, they, we, we may be having a lot of information in local languages. But I would say that this needs to be done in a more organized manner so that we have the, uh, uh, the material in English and then we have the liberate translation and dissemination so that everybody can get this information. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much. Colleagues, unfortunately, we're out of time and we've with there are many, many questions that we have not yet touched on, um, but there's hope.
Uh, first of all, these webinars will happen monthly and will hopefully provide monthly updates, including updates from our interface with providers at the front line through uh, the PATA network and the PATA survey. Um, and we'll also be launching um, uh, today on the childrenandaids.org uh, web pages a dedicated set of COVID resources and materials, which will include a discussion box that we will moderate and, and track so that we can continue to respond to uh, your many, many very interesting and very important uh, questions. Um, we will try to respond to all of these um, in, in, in due course privately to you. Uh, and we'll also try to make sure that we raise some of these threads in the discussion um, pages that we will have on the childrenandaids.org website. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over back to Rike for any last housekeeping as we conclude the webinar. And I want to thank all of you for your incredibly valuable uh, contributions from all across the world um, uh, and for participating and enriching our discussion and dialogue. I think it's, it's through working together and learning from each other that we'll be able to tackle the uh, potential um, disasters that this epidemic and the response uh, can bring to our communities and our health workers and our clients living with HIV. Um, so over back to you, please. Thank you very much, Shafiq. I just wanted to mention a few last things. Uh, one is that on our childrenandaids.org dedicated site, so childrenandaids.org slash COVID-19, apart from posting this webinar, um, the Q&A and the slides, we also have webinars from other partners and we will feature a range of partner resources, um, information portals, Q&A, policy briefs and guidance materials. Uh, those will be coming within the next day. So please stay tuned. And once we send out an email with the recording and the PowerPoint for this webinar, it should all be up there. And for UNICEF staff, you can already find all of this on our dedicated knowledge hub on uh, SharePoint, COVID-19 and HIV knowledge hub. So I would just like to say thank you once again for the th uh, to the three speakers. This has been really, really excellent. And thank you to all of you that have been participating actively and asking questions. We would really like to have feedback on this webinar. Um, as Shafiq mentioned, this is a series and there will be another one in approximately one month. So if you have any suggestions or any feedback about what you would like to learn more about, please post it on that discussion forum on Children and AIDS on Yammer if you're with UNICEF or shoot me an email. My email address is uh, listed on this slide. So thank you once again. Um, I hope it was useful and that the next one will be even more useful based on your feedback. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.